Carolina Hayes is the co-founder and CEO of OneSkin Technologies. She holds a biochemistry degree and a PhD focused on stem cell and tissue engineering. After more than 10 years of developing science in academia, she now translates the science and her knowledge to products which aim at reversing the age of human skin. Dr. Hayes, welcome to Modern Health Span and thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Richard. You're welcome. So, so Dr. Hayes, you are the uh, co-founder and CEO of OneSkin and also a co-author of the paper, Senotherapeutic Peptide Reduces Skin Biological Age and Improves Skin Health Markets, which is currently on BioArchive. Uh, can you talk about um, skin, as, as skin ages, what happens kind of at the functional and um, molecular level. And so, so this is the, the issue, the problem, I guess, that you're trying to address. Yes, sure. So there, there is a, a mosaic a model to explain skin aging that combines uh, extrinsic and intrinsic factors. Uh, so we have intrinsic factors such as chronological age or cells dividing, um, and then you have extrinsic factors such as UV radiation, uh, pollution, uh, different types of stress that, you know, environmental stresses. And this leads to damage in our skin cells. This leads, for example, to um, the skin barrier breaks. And then we have, we start leaking uh, inflammatory cytokines to our bodies. Uh, so basically, because of the skin barrier breaks and you have an increase of damage in the skin cells, you also have a um, cross link of collagen. So the extracellular matrix also change because of inflammation that start being secreted in our tissues. And this leads to the signs of skin aging that we are familiar with, that we can, you know, perceive that wrinkles, sagging, um, dark spots, and so on. So it's basically a combination of extrinsic and intrinsic factors that leads to damage in our skin cells, that leads to, you know, effects in, our, in the extracellular matrix and also in affects the skin barrier. That's the main, uh, the most important barrier, physical barrier of our body that protect us against uh, water loss, uh, microorganism infection. And once the skin barrier breaks, we not only have uh, certain uh, skin disorders, for example, eczema or atopic dermatitis, but we also have, as I said, this inflammation that's being released from our skin cells that end up, you know, affecting our bodies and the levels of inflammation in our bodies. Right. And so th this inflammation is coming from primarily from senescent cells. Is that kind of the key driver behind them? Yeah, we do believe that senescent cells are a central uh, event in the skin aging uh, and mainly because we can replicate uh, the formation of senescent cells for example by exposing skin cells to uv radiation or other uh, toxic uh, types of stresses so once we replicate that in the lab we can see that they start secreting uh, cesp right once we have senescent cells they produce this uh, specific uh, secretome uh, CESP factors that are mainly inflammatory signals. And this inflammation, again, affects uh, the cells around, uh, leads to collagen breakdown and leads to tissue dysfunction and, um, and the, this overall dysfunction of the skin. Right. So within the paper, you identify a peptide called peptide 14. So let's call it. Can you say, you know, how is that addressing this, this, this issue? Uh, yeah, how does it work? 
Yeah, so we found Peptide 14 uh, based on a, a platform that we designed uh, to screen for molecules that would decrease the level of cellular senescence. So we use different types of models. Uh, we use cells derived from progeria. Uh, we use cells derived from elderly donors. And we also use cells that we induce senescence with uh, UVB radiation. So what we did was to test um, a library of peptides. Uh, so we incubated those cells with different, initially 200, 200 peptides, and then we measured the levels of uh, beta-galactosidase activity. That's an enzyme that's very active in senescent cells. So based on that marker, we could see which peptides were performing well, reducing the total amount of senescent cells. From initially four hits uh, from four peptides, we, we made optimizations on the sequence, and then we generated uh, 800 peptides, and we did a second round of screening. So from the second round of, of screening, we basically... Uh, we were like narrowing down until we got it to OS1. Mm. And OS1 has a very interesting effect of um, improving the efficiency of the cell to repair the damage and also to decrease uh, the activation of inflammatory pathways. So because we interrupt that feed forward um, signal that uh, we have when we have senescent cells. So basically we are helping terminating CESP. So we decrease the levels of inflammation. We help your cell to repair damage. So in the end, you have a tissue with uh, less senescent cells, less inflammation that allows the tissue to be regenerated. So we can have the younger cells replicating and rebuilding extracellular matrix. And we can, again, mm. strengthen the skin barrier because you, are, you have lowered the levels of molecules that are driving aging. Right. So, the, um, so, so your skin cells get damaged or they get old, and then they're kind of heading towards senescence, which is some... Yeah, which means they've stopped dividing and, and so they go into this senescent state. And so what peptide, what OS1 is doing is it's kind of interrupting that process and kind of pushing them back towards being healthy cells and so reducing the number of senescent cells overall. Is, is that? Yeah, yeah that's, that's a good way to put it. So when the cells, are, when the cells encounter in any kind of stress, if, if they don't repair that stress, they will go to senescence. Basically, mm. if they accumulate the damage, they will go to senescence. But if they are able to repair the damage, they don't get to, to become a senescent cells. So we have a profile that's both like preventative. So basically, we are improving ourselves to avoid, to prevent senescence. Mm. And we are also helping your, some of the cells should be repaired um, so they don't, they, don't also, they don't keep feed forward in the senescence loop because one senescence, again, um, contaminates cells around to become senescent as well because of the secretion of inflammatory factors. So as to your point, yeah, we, we, we help the cells to repair so they don't secrete the senescence factors. Right, and then start that loop. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things you did was you looked at the epigenetic age of the skin, right? And uh, I believe you developed your own clock, uh, the mole clock. Can you talk about, so why did you feel that you needed to have a specific skin clock? And uh, what kind of results did you see with that? Sure. So initially we started using Horvath clocks and uh, 
when for for specific tissues, uh, the accuracy of uh, the pen tissue that Harvard developed was not so high. So when we would measure the age of fibroblast or skin tissues, we would see a larger error. So it was, was hard to rely on that clock to, to measure any biologic, skin biological age. Once you build an algorithm that's trained only with skin cells, you increase the accuracy because the epigenetic profile, it varies a lot from tissue to tissue. So you are minimizing the variables if you are training an algorithm only you know, with a specific uh, tissue sample. So that's why we decided to build our scheme specific uh, molecular clock that's called the MOL clock. And, and then we when we compared with Harvard, we saw that, yes, we improved the accuracy and then we also decreased the error. Um, and this allow us to use this tool uh, to test molecules that are, you know, intended to, re to reverse skin, by skin age and then to compare uh, different products and different types of interventions and have basically a quantitative measurement of how many years uh, that molecule or that in intervention is um, reducing or sometimes accelerating skin aging, right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, so was, was looking at the epigenetic clock part of the screening for the peptide or, or was that one of the parameters you looked at? Was part of the validation because right. it's still a pretty expensive technique ah. and it's not scalable. Mm -hmm. So usually we do the screening with a cell-based platform using senescence markers. Then we validate uh, the, the peptide or whatever compound in our 3D models. And the last step is to validate the change in the skin biological age uh, because it's yeah the most expensive I would say assay that we run. So right, uh, okay, yeah, yeah we leave, no, we leave for the last last steps. Got it. Right now, that makes sense. Um, so, how much how much improvement did you see with uh, with OS one in in the in terms of age? the biological age? Yeah, so we have tested in two different models. Um, in the three D models, three D skins that we grow, we have seen up to eight, 10 years of uh, reversing, reducing the skin biological age. Uh, the error uh, is a little bigger than when we test in skin biopsies. Mm -hmm. So skin biopsies to me is the most predictable model because it's basically a piece of skin in the dish. So what we did is to add the peptide in the media, um, the skin biopsy is in contact with that media and then we isolate the DNA, uh, run the methylation analysis and measure the biological age. In this study, we saw a reduction of uh, around three years in five days treatment. And the error was smaller. That means that the variability of, uh, you know, the measurements mm. was uh, lower. And so this was very interesting because we saw a significant decrease with our peptide. We also test rapamycin, mm. and we didn't see a significant re uh, decrease uh, with rapamycin in, when we treated in skin biopsies. Right. Interesting. Yes. So the, you made the the mole clock um, public. I think other people can use right. it. So is anyone else has anyone else kind of adopted this for testing skin? Uh, for for it's available for research purposes mm -hmm. and then yes we have seen and we we don't basically we don't control uh, or we don't open the identity but we have seen some institutions using um, for scientific uh, purposes so it's been very interesting to see other people using our clock for you know to develop their research. Right. Yeah, no, that, that's really good. Um, 
So you use some, so you, we, we talked a bit about UVB and, and external toxins um, and you did, so you used UV to, uh, I guess, stress the skin, but you, you used a toxin etoposide. How, so can you talk a little bit about what etoposide is and then how would that, um, how, how would that relate to perhaps a normal kind of toxin that we would get during every day? Yeah, in that experiment, uh, our purpose with etoposide, that's a chemotherapy, uh, was not to simulate, a, you know, a toxin stress that we encounter in our daily basis. Uh, so etoposide, with etoposide, we could induce almost 70-80% of senescence. So that means that we want to have a population that's highly senescent, so when once we treat, if we see a decrease in the total number of senescent cells, uh, we can infer is if the peptide is killing the senescent cells. Um, so in that case, it was more for a purpose of validating if, peptide, if the peptide is inducing apoptosis or autophagy and trying to understand the mechanism of action, something that we are still working on. Um, and in the case of UVB, one very interesting result that we saw is that uh, the cells that were treated with UVB and right after treated with our peptide, they, they accumulate around 50% less senescent cells meaning that the peptide is helping the cells to repair the damage caused by UVB, UVB mm. radiation. And, and that's why we have this um, claim of, you know, preventing the formation of senescent cells because we have, you know, validated in a very clear experiment that if you treat right after a stress, you can, you know, prevent the formation of senescent cells significantly. Right. Okay. So, right. So the, the, the real thing is that there is some stress. It could be chemical, it could be UVB. Um, and OS1 is kind of interrupting after that stress. And so it really doesn't matter what, what the kind of stress is, right? It, it acts in the same way. Yeah, it, that, that's a very good point. Uh, it can vary a little bit depending on the stress. The end result, it's similar. We are reducing the, the amount of senescent cells. It could vary depending on the model. We could reduce 50%. Depending on the model, we would reduce 20%. So there are some, uh, I would say, nuances on the, depending on the model. But the end result is that we reduce the amount of senescent cells. Right. Okay, interesting. So one other thing in the paper is that you talked about using the peptide with C. elegans and it extended their life, right? So you, so can you talk about that? So, so you, you just kind of put, a, put them in a, in, in a pool of peptide and how, how, did, how was the experiment run? And um, so does that make you think that you could take the peptide orally and it would extend life? Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Uh, definitely something that we are interested in exploring. So because we are targeting senescent cells, we were wondering what's the effect of uh, this peptide from a longevity you know, standpoint. And this uh, using C. elegans is a very common uh, model for aging. And basically we feed the C. elegans, right? So we add the peptide as a food in the plates where the worms are, you know, moving and eating. And we, as you said, we saw an increase in the lifespan and we also saw an increase in the health span. So the worms, they were not only living longer. That was, was significant, but was not the most impressive. The most impressive data was that they were uh, being more active throughout their lives. So again, this is more related to health span and that's something that we are all interested. And yes, because of this data, we are interested in exploring the, um, the application of uh, our peptide, uh, maybe orally, maybe as a supplement or another 
route of systemic application. We are running other studies to validate this data in other uh, experimental models. So if we can confirm this effect, we'll be moving forward with in this approach of testing an oral um, route for OS1. Right. So, I, but that, that sounds quite early at the moment. Would, would that be correct? Yeah, is it, st yeah. Is it still very early? Uh, definitely only preliminary data. And then even like if we would test a neuro application would be animals first, and then we would evaluate mm. if oral is the best route. And if it makes sense to be like a supplement or it makes sense to address, you know, a specific disease. One vision that I have because of the safety profile of this peptide is that it could work as a preventative therapy. So if our peptide is helping our cells to repair uh, the damage in skin cells, if, if we can increase the efficiency of our cells in our whole body to repair damage, basically we, we are extending our health span, right? We are decreasing mm. inflammation, we are functioning better. So my vision is that we we'll eventually get to a, a therapy that will help extending health instead right. of in just you know addressing a specific disease or an age-related disease. Right, excellent. I hope that you found the video informative. Please do hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to our channel and hit the bell button and choose all for any new video release notifications. It encourages us to continue to create more videos about anti-aging and extending healthy lifespan. Thank you so much for your kind support. I wish you all well and we'll speak to you again soon. Mm -hmm.